Good afternoon. Welcome to the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, welcome particularly to many government officials and also to the many people, um, including some journalists, who are joining us from India and Pakistan. Uh, I'm Ben Barry and I'm a part-time member of the South Asia program. Uh, we've got a very active program uh, where we study the security of South Asia. A major issue in the region is the considerable tension between India and Pakistan. Uh, both states, of course, nuclear armed. Uh, we've been seeking to better understand the nuclear dimension of this tension. Today, we've published the findings of our most recent research in the report, Nuclear Deterrence and Stability in South Asia, Perceptions and Realities. And the report itself will be posted on the ISS website at 14.30 London time this afternoon as the meeting uh, finishes. Today, Antoine Levesque, who's led the work, uh, has also published an op-ed on this subject, which is published both in India and Pakistan this morning in the Tribune in India and the News in Pakistan. Uh, to explain the work and its key findings, uh, we have uh, Antoine Levesque, the research fellow for South Asia here, uh, Desmond Byrne, an associate fellow in the South Asia program at IISS, and Jack Gill, who's also an associate fellow in our program, and he's also an adjunct professor at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies in Washington, DC. Uh, their biographies were on the event invitation. Uh, they will each speak in the order on the invitation for seven, eight minutes. After that, there will be time for questions. Um, this meeting is entirely on the record. Um, we'll also be uh, using written questions only, which we'd like you to support. We'd like you to um, provide using the Q&A function on uh, the Zoom software. Time is short, so please feel free to put questions, but we'd like them to be short and succinct. We certainly won't have time for long statements. I'd like to start with Antoine introducing the report. Over to you, Antoine. Thank you, Ben. Good day to all. Um, welcome again to the launch of Nuclear Deterrence and Stability in South Asia, Perceptions and Realities, the latest of the Institute series of freely accessible reports and assessments from the in-house research team. This 72-page analysis brings key insights on an important, though rarely urgent enough, strategic issue in, in Asian and wider global security. The IISS mission is to generate facts, analysis, and exert influence across the three broad themes of war, power, and rules. This report concentrates on the first of those themes primarily, without excluding the two others. The India-Pakistan nuclear deterrence relationship affects the changing character of conflict in South Asia as much as it is shaped by it. But also the report more tangentially considers the interplay of nuclear deterrence with the changing nature of types of power and influence wielded in international affairs, as well as with rulemaking and rule-taking within alliance and partnership structures. This is the first standalone publication by the IISS on the nuclear deterrence relationship between both India and Pakistan since Sir Hilary Sinnott's 1999 Adelphi paper took stock of the causes and consequences of India and Pakistan's nuclear tests. The purpose of the present report is to examine nuclear deterrence and stability in South Asia by separating perceptions from facts in order to assess the extent to which India and Pakistan may be at risk from imprudent or mistaken use of nuclear weapons. This report is the product of a meeting of a necessity with an opportunity. The necessity is born out of an observation which we made our starting point. The uncomfortable truth is that alongside judgment and certainly what both countries see as astuteness, chance played an ameliorative role in the February 2019 India-Pakistan security crisis. Any failure of deterrence leading to the first offensive use of a nuclear weapon since 1945 would potentially escalate into a broader nuclear exchange. The worldwide con consequences would be catastrophic and entirely unacceptable for anything less than ensuring the very survival of either state. 
Additionally, we made three other assumptions, which we do not expect everyone to share. One, that India and Pakistan have suffered a diplomatic lost uh, decade plus um, since the appalling uh, November 2008 uh, Mumbai attacks. Second, since 2008, precious few low or even high level diplomatic or paradiplomatic initiatives seem to have convinced India and Pakistan that the focus of their national nuclear efforts should be on lowering the risk of deterrence failure. And three, a strong case can be made that India and Pakistan can overcome perceptions that their disputes are intractable and insurmountable. But this would require both countries to give careful thought to what is truly in their long-term national interest. The opportunity now originates in the rare insights we have been fortunate to gather from involvement as a IISS team in the last decade in uninterrupted engagement with the national security establishments of both India and Pakistan on these issues. As a result, we were keen to create a strong factual evidence base, drawing on our understanding from both experience and Track 1.5 discussions to intervene when public evidence is incomplete or contradictory. As a result, we set out to produce an accessible document demonstrating that the subject matter is neither too difficult nor too secret to explore. As such, this report will interest foremost government officials as much as political leaders or broader interested audiences of both countries and beyond. And I'm delighted, I insist on Ben's point, for so many officials um, and others to have joined us today. The result of this pragmatic analysis suitably um, is balanced, sober and crisp. As much as is possible on matters of deterrence, we separate fact or evidence from suggestion and take the reader from concepts all the way to practical policy implications. The report extensively uses text boxes to present evidence from official statements. Our assessment also relies on exclusive data from the Military Balance Plus, IISS's market-leading online open source database. Four annexes include a full data table detailing the status of India and Pakistan's missile systems in service and in development, as well as the detailed list of 12 confidence building measures, CBMs, currently in place. The conclusion lists a series of 15 most promising confidence building measures related to nuclear weapons. Deliberate choices to restrict the scope of discussion in this report, in this report reflect our preference for concentration rather than dispersion. The overwhelming focus is on nuclear deterrence at the highest end of the scale um, of um, conflict. We do therefore, for instance, discuss China's role in shaping the India-Pakistan nuclear relationship but not to the point of it. We argue that China's evolving profile as a nuclear weapon state is compounding India's security challenges, yet control over the drivers of the India-Pakistan nuclear deterrence and uh, stability equation specifically remains almost entirely in the hands of leaders in New Delhi and Islamabad. I mentioned earlier the 1998 nuclear tests. This very month, the two nuclear-armed neighbours remember their momentous days for their, for their countries, which saw them undertake nuclear weapon tests. At this time, this report presents up-to-date evidence of grave, unresolved structural deficiencies and asymmetries in India and Pakistan's nuclear doctrines, which are compounded by mutual disbelief existing and emerging military capabilities, and the prolonged absence of related dialogue mechanisms. The argument starts from an examination of the utility of nuclear doctrine and the desirability of out-of-reach and out-of-reach quality of strategic stability. With this foundation, we proceed on um, with an assessment of India and Pakistan's nuclear doctrines. Desmond will say a little more about this after me. Therefore, thereon, it is possible to identify some of the risks presented by both sides, existing military capabilities, and by emerging technological developments, including in the maritime domain. Jack, in turn, will say more about this. The closing discussion 
introduces possible avenues for preserving nuclear deterrence and preventing unintended nuclear risks through renewed confidence building. In our view, only India and Pakistan can choose to creatively overcome the challenges to adopting new risk reduction measures as an imperfect but realistic stopgap until trust building and eventual political dialogue make arms control possible. The last chapter of the report examines nuclear CBMs in the broader context of a fatigue, as the word goes in the region, which has gripped both governments. Since 2008, no significant uh, risk reduction CBM has been adopted. If the prospects of outright arms control and building political trust appear too remote, adopting a new realistic and diverse set of military and nuclear CBMs could help build an up-to-date framework of understanding. It is to this end, specifically, that this report identifies a list of potentially useful CBMs and other practical steps both countries could take early on with the right opportunities and political will. This remains true despite the inbuilt limitations of CBMs and their checkered history in the region. By relying, for example, on transparency measures, both countries could communicate the nuclear doctrines more clearly. The report also considers the utility of setting up and sustaining a robust, trusted, reliable and deniable back channel between the leaderships as the possibly single most important means by which the two countries could achieve greater strategic and nuclear deterrence stability. This is in their interests and operationalizing it would be their decision. Such a mechanism would help avoid and mitigate the costs of any future crisis, as well as eventually help India and Pakistan to adopt new CBMs on the way to building greater trust. This comes in the context where the new uh, United States um, uh, Biden administration and the United Kingdom's uh, integrated review each take approaches which could encourage India and Pakistan in this direction. I will stop here and yield the floor to my colleague Desmond. Ben. So, um, welcome to the IISS from me, Desmond Bowen. I've been involved in the past in nuclear policy for the government of the UK, but most uh, recently, more recently, I have worked with the IISS to understand the security issues confronting South Asia, and in particular, the implications of nuclear deterrence policy. I shall focus my comments on doctrine, um, what it is, why it's important, and the implications uh, of the asymmetry of the doctrines espoused by India and Pakistan, respectively. Of course, doctrine must be seen in the context of the physical capabilities of the nuclear arsenal that has been developed and deployed, the state's overall military preparedness, the command and control uh, arrangements, and the perception of political will. Um, the, uh, the writing and communication of nuclear doctrine is first and foremost a political declaration directed at potential adversaries. Its essential purpose is to dissuade an opponent from aggression to influence the calculation in the mind of that opponent's leadership that such an act would not go unpunished and would not succeed. There is, of course, a second purpose, which is to send a message of reassurance to the domestic audience about the government's commitment to national security and to its own civil and military officials who would be directly involved in the event of a crisis. Another audience is, of course, the wider world and think tanks like the IISS. In addressing ourselves to doctrine, I just make the point that doctrine is not the absolute be-all and end-all. It's not binding, and when a crisis emerges, it's never certain that the doctrine will be adhered to. But nevertheless, the doctrine is the only thing we have to hold on to that we know of. So nuclear doctrine is a statement of intent about the potential use of nuclear weapons. We say clearly that there are universal principles to be applied here. 
Nuclear weapons have devastating destructive capacity. They are set apart in a category of their own as weapons of mass destruction. Mass destruction. We have underlined the principles of necessity and proportionality with the corollary that a limited act of interstate violence does not justify an unlimited act of retaliation. Breaking the nuclear taboo would, we believe, fundamentally change the nature of any conflict with unmanageable consequences. And we make plain that inflicting unacceptable damage on an, on an opponent could only be justified when national survival is at stake. These should only be considered as weapons of last resort. That is the yardstick by which this paper measures doctrine. Now, some of the NATO doctrine of the past, of past eras, would not have scored well by these uh, criteria going back to the 1950s. But there has been significant evolution over time, above all because of the recognition of the uncontainable global risks inherent in any potential nuclear use. In various nuclear-related crises, I am happy to say, political leaders in the past seem to have understood the absolute priority to be given to caution. Now, on the doctrines of India and Pakistan, we argue that there is sufficient clarity, even if we have to rely on drafts, fragmentary official statements, press releases, and commentary. Both parties are committed to credible minimum deterrence. Both aver that they have a second strike capability. Neither speaks of preemption. But the fundamental difference is that India has a policy of no first use, and Pakistan has a policy of full spectrum deterrence. India threatens massive retaliation for any nuclear use on its territory or against its armed forces, whereas Pakistan seeks to deny all but the most limited conventional conflict with the threat of a low-yield, short-range nuclear weapon in the first place. Now, the nightmare scenario is that India suffers a major terrorist attack which it judges to be sponsored by Pakistan and decides as a result on a conventional act of military punishment. Pakistan then decides to check that attack with the use of a small, in other words, low yield, but I'd stress that that's very much a, um, a relative term, a small short range nuclear weapon intending both a tactical effect and a halt to the conflict. As far as India is concerned, the only escalation is to massive nuclear retaliation. Now, this is not a random invention, but deduced from the intersection of real life experience and an examination of the two doctrines. We argue that use by either side in this sequence of events, in the scenario I have set out, would be disproportionate. It would also be unnecessary unless the survival of the state was in jeopardy. Embedded in this nightmare, and nightmare I think it is, and for the avoidance of doubt, is that neither side believes in the doctrine of the other, or so we are told. Incredible, in other words, incredible to the other side, to the would-be adversary, Incredible doctrine gives rise to enormous risk, especially when animal spirits are released by violence as a conflict unfolds. And that is why we advocate that the risk should be reduced and nuclear weapons treated as instruments of last resort. Thanks very much. Thank you, Desmond. Over to you, Jack. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jack Gill, and I've spent most of my professional career on security issues dealing with South Asia. Please note that I speak entirely in my personal capacity, although I have been a government employee. I no longer am, but I do retain, as Antoine noted, an affiliation with the Near East, or as Ben noted, an affiliation with the Near East South Asia Center in Washington, D.C. 
I'll talk for a few moments about the capabilities of India and Pakistan in uh, context of uh, Mr. Bowen's remarks and the monograph, and I'll endeavor to highlight risk in the process. Two observations are pertinent at the start. First, we have tried here to make clear that the situation between India and Pakistan encompasses the entire spectrum of warfare, that is from terrorism through the conventional uh, warfare and its many gradations up to nuclear war at the highest end as Desmond has just discussed. Second, although the monograph is focused on India and Pakistan, I would reinforce what Antoine said at the beginning that we have repeatedly noted the, that the subcontinental nuclear dynamic is triangular as India must always consider China in both the conventional and nuclear arenas. So with that, let me start with conventional capabilities. And we have begun with brief observations on the qualitative and quantitative aspects of the conventional forces as these set the context for considerations of nuclear weapons. From the qualitative standpoint, there's really little difference between the two sides, India and Pakistan, certainly nothing decisive or unquestionably war winning, however one decides to define that term. Quantitatively, India, however, has clear numerical advantages in most areas. This is by no means the only factor that drives Pakistan's nuclear weapons program, but is one of the ones most frequently cited by Pakistanis. However, India's seeming nuclear or numerical advantages are deceptive in a context where India has to simultaneously cope with a growing Chinese threat in all domains, where India's three services fail to work together synergistically, either within the services or in a joint tri-service manner, and where much of India's military hardware is either obsolescent, if not obsolete. Furthermore, most Indian and Pakistani strategists expect that any new conflict, heaven forbid, would be short. All of this means that it is highly unlikely that India's numerical advantages would manifest themselves decisively in an automatic decisive victory at some present or foreseeable future. We also conclude that Indian modernization initiatives are not likely to alter this judgment in any policy relevant timeframe. We, uh, the risk here, of course, is that one side or both could miscalculate relative to the strengths and weaknesses of each other in ways that might precipitate a crisis or elevate a crisis to war or lead to escalation in a war, escalation that could be horizontal, could be vertical, both up to the nuclear level. Turning to nuclear capabilities, we had to, to contend, of course, with the pervasive secrecy practiced by both sides, which means that much of what we have to say is at best estimated. For example, the estimated number of warheads currently give Pakistan a slight edge, but this difference is actually irrelevant in any practical sense. Based on fissile material stocks, one can estimate that either side could produce more, perhaps twice as many warheads as it currently has, but neither is assessed to have done so at present. In the past, weapons have been stored in demated status, as far as we understand, that is warheads physically separated from delivery means, thus greatly reducing the chances of unauthorized use theft or launch. However, the move of nuclear weapons to sea, greater readiness imperatives, the counterterrorization of missiles, and to a lesser degree, Pakistan's deployment of so-called battlefield weapons all erode this former barrier. For delivery means, both sides rely on a mixture of gravity bombs, ballistic missiles, and cruise missiles. The missiles capable of being delivered by air, ground, or and now sea platforms as both sides seek to create nuclear triads. On the Pakistani side, although Pakistan is thought to reserve a certain proportion of its arsenal for gravity bombs to be delivered by aircraft, it relies primarily on a very broad array of ground-based ballistic missiles now supplemented by air-launched air and ground-launched cruise missiles. In addition to attacks on military targets, Pakistan's missiles thus give it an ability to hit any city in India should it elect a counter value, in other words, a strikes against civilian targets to inflict the unacceptable damage to which Desmond referred. Two of Pakistan's nuclear delivery decisions are especially controversial. The first is the introduction of the Nusser system, uh, which has a range of only 60 kilometers, therefore is a tactical or battlefield, or as Pakistanis prefer, short range, low yield system. The rationale here has been as a, to serve as a means to deter India's so-called cold start army doctrine. As Desmond has commented, the Nusser suggests use of nuclear weapons well before national survival is at stake. It also poses particularly worrying command and control issues and presents a problematic target on the tactical battlefield. Second is the development of missiles at ranges out to 3,000 kilometers. 
allegedly because of an Indian missile test facility in, located in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, a rationale that does not seem consistent with the infliction of unacceptable damage for deterrence purposes. Furthermore, of course, such missiles could turn in any direction, including towards the Middle East. As for India, it, like Pakistan, has an arsenal of aircraft and missile-delivered nuclear warheads. Its range of missiles, however, is less diverse, with a mix of short-range systems that could be employed against Pakistan and longer-range variants that would be aimed at Chinese targets. As far as is known, India has not developed a nuclear warhead for a cruise missile. It could, of course, choose to do so at some point. Likewise, India is not assessed to have a short-range, low-yield battlefield nuclear delivery system comparable to the Pakistani Nusser. We discussed the sea leg based uh, portion of India's nuclear triad with the completion of the first so called deterrent patrol of its first uh, ballistic missile submarine, the INS Arihant. The missiles available for the Arihant thus far, however, only allow it to target Pakistan. So it is limited in the value as a sea based deterrent until longer range missiles and additional submarines are deployed that could place China within range on a consistent basis. This Indian action has prompted a Pakistani response with the apparent preparation of submarine launched cruise missiles to be carried on Pakistan's small diesel submarine fleet. These moves by the two sides raise questions about nuclear command and control in crisis and the mating of weapons to delivery systems once they're placed aboard the submarines. In sum, both sides have the capability to inflict unacceptable damage on one another where Pakistan is focused primarily on India. However, India must also retain a certain number of weapons to hold key Chinese targets at risk. With that very uh, brief uh, overview of a very, very complex issue, let me conclude with several quick observations. First, India's conventional numerical advantage, while not imaginary, is not sufficient to guarantee a decisive victory in the sort of short war that both sides expect. Moreover, India has neither reason nor interest in attacking Pakistan outside of severe provocation. Such provocation, as Desmond noted, would most likely come in the form of terrorism or militancy, thus creating a direct connection between asymmetric warfare, as it's euphemistically termed, and nuclear exchange, another crucial risk. Second, the capabilities already possessed by each side are sufficient to inflict the unacceptable damage postulated as necessary for deterrence. Both sides thus have to decide what the minimum in their claimed credible minimum deterrence policies mean. So far, the term minimum often seems so elastic as to be meaningless. Third, a number of serious risks lurk inside the extent capabilities. For example, Pakistan's Nusser, short range, low yield, presents a number of command and control and security issues, a discrimination problem on the tactical battlefield, and possible use that is not consistent with the idea of nuclear weapons as last resort with national survival at stake. Pakistan's desire to target every inch of India seems excessive to the needs of deterrence, the movement of nuclear weapons to sea by both sides, and the dangers of new technologies driving design and acquisition. That is to say, multiple warhead vehicles, hypersonic delivery vehicles, anti-satellite systems, etc. And India's requirements, of course, to cope with China create strategic anxieties for Pakistan to which it feels it must respond. These developments pose a number of difficult questions for the future. Finally, the threat of miscalculation remains high and new capabilities or even the retention of old outmoded capabilities can generate unpredictable dynamics that degrade rather than reinforce stability. On that note, allow me to say thank you again and return the floor to Ben. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, just to remind our, our audience that uh, you're welcome to put questions in writing using the Q&A button on the Zoom software. Uh, we've had eight questions and points and I'm going to, forget, I'm going to introduce them. Uh, we had a useful point from Dr. Balkrishna Kirvi of the Indian Institute for Peace, where he reminded us uh, that any nuclear war between the two states would affect millions of people some of whom would die horribly, some of whom would die a lingering death from radiation, and there would be severe economic impact, including quite possibly um, starv starvation. Uh, and I think it's a, use, it's a useful reminder. Uh, we've had two questions like I'd like to brigade together uh, from Adil Sultan of um, the Air University in Islamabad. How do you assess India's no first use commitment, keeping in view the fact that Prime Minister Modi signaled a possibility of nuclear first use. 
against Pakistan during the February 2019 crisis, when he ordered the mobilization of dual use Prithvi missiles. And there is discussion of that crisis in the report. But I'd also like to bring in a similar question from Chanka Shekhar from the JNU in New Delhi. Um, how non-state actors are playing a reinforcing role in enhancing strategic mistrust between India and Pakistan, um, which obviously contributes to complicating the nuclear deterrence game. And his specific question is, why doesn't Pakistan come up with a no first use policy uh, like India? Um, Antoine? Thank you, Ben, and thank you to our participants. Um, I think um, the point um, in the form of a comment, which you relayed to us, Ben, first about the um, dreadful impact of um, nuclear use in, um, in the region, is a point we acknowledge at the very start um, of the report in the introduction. Indeed, there have been um, some, um, re some research scientific reports um, published in the last couple of years, which have updated simulations of um, how disastrous the effect on um, many levels uh, would be from uh, nuclear use, uh, even of so-called small scale in the region. Um, to Dr. Sultan, um, our former colleague, um, uh, question, I think our assessment is clear that um, as of uh, today, India is um, strongly committed to a no first use policy. Um, we reference in the document the evidence um, which abounds in this direction while also acknowledging the fact which uh, you, Dr. Sultan, raise um, um, also. Um, it's important here, I think, to uh, rely on the um, uh, judgment which we form based on some of the um, conversations which uh, we reckon are representative of official thinking in, in the country. Um, and as for the role of non-state uh, actors, I think uh, my colleagues can talk to that um, also. But we make clear in the first chapter of this um, study that Really, um, there is a full uh, scale um, of um, use of force available to both countries, and Ben uh, reminded us that um, that scale uh, is particularly um, active um, across um, both uh, countries' perceptions of conflict. Um, but um, at the same time, um, we are here focusing specifically on the high-end nuclear uh, dynamics. And one of the caveats um, uh, and focus points we make in the introduction is that um, we focus less on the um, uh, pathways uh, to crisis, which can be gained, uh, which can be uh, assessed in a number of creative uh, ways. Um, but um, I should stress that our focus is primarily on the, um, the, the nuclear dimension, not so much the pathways. But I'll let my colleagues come in on either of these points. Jack, have you got anything to say? Yeah, I would only add on the no first use issue that uh, this policy has served India very well. And it gains nothing really from changing that stance. And every official statement continually reiterates that no first use remains India's official policy. Every time India has considered this, and there is a debate, a very uh, thoughtful and reasonable debate in India on no first use, as we all know, but every time they've considered this, the answer has always been no, there's no point in changing, and it would be disadvantageous to change that policy. On uh, Dr. Kirby's very cogent point, uh, I would reiterate or reinforce Antoine's uh, reference to a recent report that was published last year on not just the regional, but the global uh, catastrophic impact of a major exchange in India between India and Pakistan. And the, uh, the climate, uh, climatological impact would be disastrous. Although I am not an expert on uh, public health, one might also note that the current health crisis in South Asia, especially India and Nepal, for which we are very, we express our sympathies, that this puts into question how any public health system in the region 
could cope with the uh, disastrous number of instantaneous and lingering casualties that would result from even a limited use of nuclear weapons. And uh, it's easy to imagine that any health system in either country would quickly be overwhelmed uh, totally be by that, uh, that sort of a, a situation. Desmond, do you want to say anything? Um, I mean, the only thing I would say in answer to the question about um, is uh, India um, or might India be um, changing or reassessing its no first use policy? I mean, part of the, I mean, I know there's been lots of speculation, there's been lots of, um, uh, I mean, a sort of, not exactly a sort of systematic desire to prod this issue and to hope that it's got life. I mean, part of the object of writing this study is to say that that hypothesis doesn't seem to have legs. I mean, there is, there is a reaffirmation of no first use every time for political or other reasons. Uh, somebody says, mm, maybe we should have a look at this. Um, and so that's part of the, the object of the study is to say, you know, this is, this is where we are and no first use is there and it seems to be there to stay. Uh, thank you, Jack Desmond. I'd like to combine together uh, several points about uh, the influence of actors other than India and Pakistan. Um, Mampri Sethi from the Centre for Air Power Studies in India um, finds our list of confidence building measures helpful. Uh, but she says she, don't, she wonders if we think many of these, especially those related to arms control or MIRVs and ballistic missile defence, are not doable unless China is brought in too. And of course, China also has its eyes on the US and, and Washington. Uh, so she makes the point that regional nuclear dynamics is not just triangular, uh, but much more complex. And that point is reinforced by a question from Petr Tobichkanov from the Stockholm International Peace Research Assistance Institute, who asks, uh, what do we think of the Chinese dimension here? India might prefer to have some confidence building measures with China first, or does the Chinese factor remain a lower priority for, for India? Um, so that's one of the major outside actors. And then there's also a question from uh, Matthew Harris here in the UK, uh, formerly of IISS and now of the Royal United Services Institute. Um, and he asks um, about the UK role. Is the UK relevant? Is it seen as an honest broker? Is the UK doing everything it can to promote stability? And if not, uh, what more could it be doing? So I think by extension, that question would also apply to the role of the US as well, bearing in mind we have a very diff different government uh, in power from the 2019 February crisis. Um, so perhaps if we could hear your views on uh, the importance of China in general and specifically with regard to the questions asked and also whether the UK or US uh, for acting from the outside can add any value. Uh, perhaps I'd ask Jack to start from the East Coast of the US. <laughs> sure, uh, in, uh, in, and thank you Manpreet, nice to hear from you. Uh, I think, I mean, it, the China com factor is extremely, uh, certainly is a, a great complication for dealing with India and Pakistan because India has to look uh, look north as well as west. And the events of the past year uh, with the Galwan crisis beginning in uh, last spring, this around this time, uh, only highlight that. However, that to me, that does not uh, negate the opportunities for India and Pakistan bilaterally to develop uh, measures that reduce the risk between the two of them. Uh, and it would be uh, China traditionally has not been very interested in arms control measures. Uh, they have sometimes engaged in confidence building programs with other countries. But uh, to me, this would be, uh, this does not mean that India and Pakistan together cannot come up with uh, clever ways that they too, the two of them could work together to reduce the risk between them, which would be in China's interest as well, since China has no, no desire to see the two go to war, let alone escalate to any degree in this that we discussed in the report. Uh, on, um, on outside players, uh, to me, the greatest thing, 
the greatest role that can be played is, uh, if I can quote the new president, uh, the power of our example and the example set by not just the United States, but by Russia and China uh, as global actors can be very beneficial, but that should not delay India and Pakistan from, as Antoine pointed out in his opening remarks, investigating areas where they can work together on their own. So waiting for the outside world uh, does not serve, in my view, uh, Indian interests or Pakistani interests. Thank you. Esmond? Can I just add one point about CBMs? Um, and I just don't disagree with anything that Jack said, but um, there's a tendency always to think of the specific measures and what they bring to security, which of course is important and is the ultimate aim. But the fact of having a dialogue about um, CBMs and contact and enhanced understanding of the other side, I think is really important too. And I mean, I say that as somebody who was involved for something like four years doing conventional arms control and negotiations in Europe. And I mean, it does actually change perceptions and it's not just lowly bureaucrats, but actually ministers get involved and senior military people. I mean, it's, you know, it's an important part of breaking down barriers and creating understanding rather than you know, reveling in, in um, misunderstanding. Um, and I mean, I would say also that um, one of the, I mean, this is a different point, but I mean, I think one of the points that is made, has been made to me on a number of occasions to, as it were, to try to reassure me that actually uh, the ghastly steps that would lead to some kind of nuclear exchange would never happen is because um, I'm told that the, the you know, the, India and Pakistan are inheritors of um, a, a great civilization, are indeed a great civilization now, and civilizational restraint would be uppermost in the mind of uh, many of the actors. And, and I mean, I think that um, you know, the question is whether you rely upon you know, a general feeling about uh, civilizational restraint or whether actually you try to uh, translate that into confidence building measures and contact and back channels and all the rest of it, I mean, I think is, is really, um, really important. And it does seem to me that there has been um, contact and there have been, there are existing CBMs right now. There's something to build on, trying to say, well, let's you know, leave that to one side and start on a new course with China it seems to be, um, you know, at best ambitious. Um, there doesn't seem to be much uh, enthusiasm as um, both, as well, certainly as the Americans know from engaging with the Chinese on measures of that sort. Thanks Desmond. Antoine, do you want to add anything? Yes, a couple of points. Um, to Manpreet Seti's question, um, China, it's, uh, it's a difficult uh, case. We do discuss it in some detail in, in the report. Um, I think we make the observation that um, uh, attempts um, or suggestions that perhaps um, India could seek to bifurcate its forces in a way which might reassure Pakistan about their use is not an idea which is getting any traction in uh, India or in, in either in Pakistan. Um, there would be uh, trust um, and um, and uh, compliance uh, problems um, uh, writ large involved in, in this sort of uh, uh, issue, which leaves us indeed with um, a largely triangular um, situation, uh, difficult for um, uh, anyone to um, uh, really set priorities against uh, in terms of, uh, of, of reassurance. Um, I would add that in the context of a previous question about um, NFU, um, China plays um, a rising role in a greater role in the way India is now, um, I think, protective of its, um, of its NFU, because um, in the uh, relationship, deterrence relationship with uh, China, um, NFU is, is an asset, um, and uh, if only for this reason, it reinforces um, 
um, the uh, validity of the argument uh, also with, uh, with Pakistan. Um, there was a question about CBMs, um, I think, and their order, and the possible um, matrix one would make between the important um, uh, and the less important, and the uh, urgent and less urgent. I think it would depend on the availability of political will and um, certainly the pre-existence of a political dialogue, of which there is none at present. Um, but in the list of 15 items we find, I would posit that item number four, risk reduction centres, or for example, um, I think item number 10, negative security assurances at sea, would fall um, reasonably in the area of being um, important and uh, feasible. And that is a, then the start of a conversation about the relative merits um, of how a, bun, a, 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 a set of measures can be, can be reached as a group versus uh, individual uh, initiatives. Back to you, Ben. Thank you, Thank you very much, Antoine. Um, I've had some interesting questions on confidence building measures. Uh, one from Samad Naeem, um, who mentions the dis mutual distrust between India and Pakistan. And his question is, how should a confidence building approach actually be started? Um, there was another questioner who asked what the priorities for the confidence building research are. They noticed that they didn't appear uh, prioritized in the way we presented them. So it'd be interesting to hear that the speaker's priori priorities. And we also had one from Adrian Cowdery, um, and who noted that CBM 14 referred to a back channel for handling crises. He pointed out that that's a, a singular description of a black back channel. Uh, should there not be more uh, back channels, particularly uh, some form of a military back channel for handling misunderstandings that could escalate? Uh, so perhaps if you, yeah, we could just explore uh, the CBM and back channel measures just a bit further. Uh, perhaps Desmond, you'd like to start? Uh, well, yeah, briefly. Um, I mean, back channels have existed in the past. Back channels um, seem to come back into focus a month or so ago, according to uh, press reports. Um, but they may have receded since. Um, I mean, I think that you know, the observation that the double I, double S uh, would make is that back channels are not just useful, they're probably vital um, in the event of a crisis. And in the um, Paul Wama um, crisis, it seems, and again, this is, you know, reporting, public reporting and after the event um, uh, knowledge, um, it seems that a back channel was brought into being between, I think, intelligence um, elements on both sides um, and I mean, the, I mean the view that I have certainly is that you know you don't want to rely upon fixing up some back channels at the last moment what you really want is some reliable channel which is established and exists and there is confidence that you know those who are involved you know are speaking for their masters um, and can communicate reliably. Um, I mean, there was a point about um, uh, military people having a contact. Well, there is, there is, that is one of the CBMs that already exists. The DGMOs on both sides, Pakistan and India, have a hotline of sorts um, that they speak to each other, um, particularly, I think, about you know, issues that arise over Kashmir when there's, you know, firing and rockets and so forth. Um, but um, it tends to be quite, um, I think, narrow. And clearly sometimes the telephone doesn't get picked up at the other end. And I think that in the um, Paul Wama crisis, as I understood it, um, the DGMOs were not engaged, um, which was, I think, disappointing. Um, 
So, and, and as to the question, uh, I don't know why I'm answering all these questions. Everybody else ought to do this, really. But the, the, I mean, the, the point about, you know, where do you start? I mean, the fact is that there have been channels. There has been a process, um, you know, over you know, 20 years and more. Um, and it's a question of whether you can resurrect that in some way that is acceptable politically to both sides. Um, and with, you know, maybe, you know, the first thing is actually to get people talking to each other um, uh, rather than to set your heart on a, a particular CBM. It seems to me to actually have a channel and make it work is, is a really important first step. Thanks. Antoine, have you got anything to say? Yes, I, I would just um, uh, borrow a concept from uh, from economics and and say that um, to to reiterate what Desmond just uh, insisted on, back channels can function um, in a cyclical or counter cyclical uh, manner. Um, if times are bad, they can help avoid the situation deteriorating further. If times are relatively more benign they can be uh, supportive given the right political will and the right trust and the right personnel. They can be supportive of a broader uh, political process or at the very least a sense of political re-engagement. I think this is very, very important. Um, the scope of this question goes beyond that of nuclear weapons uh, quite obviously but um, it's acutely relevant to uh, the subject of this report, and we duly uh, discuss this uh, in, more, in more details. I would prefer um, uh, our answer to, uh, to the text of the report in a few minutes. OK, thank you, Antoine. Jack, you've got something to say? Yes, I would argue that having multiple, to pick up on what Desmond said, having multiple channels that might conflict with one another is potentially confusing and if not dangerous. So that's uh, that's one point. Better to be uniform and unitary so you know that the, uh, your interlocutor on the other side is truly speaking from the, the official level and can represent his country's uh, or his or her country's uh, perspective. Military to military links, on the other hand, beyond the DGMO hotline would be extraordinarily helpful. And I could talk about that for a long time, uh, but it's been very, very difficult to orchestrate. Uh, it would be useful, and this is a good point to highlight something that Desmond hinted at, which is that during the Cold War, the US and the Soviet Union had continual contact on arms control discussions I mean, throughout, even in the worst of times. And even then, it was very difficult for us to understand one another. They misunderstood us. We misunderstood them. It was problematic. I would argue India and Pakistan do not understand each other as well as they think that they do, and that they would benefit from having those kind of continual contacts. A starting point might be to update the conventional uh, array of conventional CBMs that do exist into the nuclear level. The ceasefire that's been recently re-instituted along the Kashmir line of control is an excellent starting point. We can hope that that will be built upon. But there's a serious obstacle, as Antoine noted at the very beginning, in what we have called CBM fatigue, borrowing a phrase from a Pakistani colleague, where many, pa many Pakistanis and Indians who went through this process when there was a high uh, intensity look at CBMs in the early 1990s, Many of them will say, oh, not more CBMs. What good are those? We can't have CBMs till we trust each other, which kind of reverses the whole notion of what CBMs are about in the first place. So that is an obstacle that has to be overcome by both sides with the political will to do so. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, time marches on, and I'd like to brigade together uh, three questions by retired senior, senior officials. Um, the first one by Tom McCain who asks, can we envisage circumstances in which India could threaten Pakistan's existence with a conventional attack? Um, and that's related to two questions by retired uh, Indian senior officers. Uh, Lieutenant General Amit Sharma observes that India and China are both uh, no first use nuclear powers, which creates strategic stability between the two. Could Pakistan adopt a no first use policy or at least a more restrained policy as tactical nukes? Um, and it's full spectrum de de deterrence gives an impression of trigger happiness. And Vice Admiral Shekhar Shina 
uh, has made the point that nuclear weapons have only deterred use of nuclear weapons, whereas conventional weapons have continued to be added to the armory on both sides. Do you think that nuclear weapons deter conventional war? They're quite different questions, but actually there's quite a lot of overlap between them. And as we've got five minutes left, I'd also offer each of the panelists the opportunity to make a, a single concluding point um, drawing on either the report or this afternoon's discussion. And I'll go in the order in which we kicked off, starting with Antoine. Thank you, uh, Ben. These are, these are excellent questions. Um, I um, hear the question from uh, our colleague and indeed a very experienced official, General Sharma. Um, his point about China and the NFU is, uh, is correct. Uh, the stabilizing effect is, uh, is, is significant. I have seen um, on his point about Pakistan adopting an NFU, I have seen low level um, 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 conversation, um, public conversation about um, the merits and demerits of, uh, of such a, a step. I don't think uh, there is any serious consideration being given to this um, in, in Pakistan. I would agree that um, should this uh, be adopted, it would make a large uh, change in the atmospherics of the region. Um, but I, I don't see a, a strategic rationale for, for this, and we certainly uh, abound in that direction in, in, in the report. Um, the question of conventional attack by India uh, of magnitude which might uh, trigger um, use. Um, I, I can think about uh, General Kidwai's um, original red lines um, uh, expressed to journalists um, early on in the nuclear age in, uh, in South Asia. These red lines, um, I think, have evolved. Um, but there is um, a question about the economy, and with this brings the question of a naval blockade, uh, although the China-Pakistan uh, economic corridor would have an interesting interference uh, effect with, with this. Um, I also note that um, in the chapter three of, uh, of, or chapter five, four of this report, we talk a little bit about cyber capabilities. And we take note um, of the fact that um, the Pakistani military um, attributed to India uh, in the last few months uh, what it called a major uh, cyber attack. Now, we are not um, in the right order of magnitude, but um, um, we should think along those lines also beyond uh, conventional military uh, operations. I'll stop there. Thank you. Desmond? Um, let me just pick up um, one or two of those points. I mean, the, the idea of India threatening the existence of Pakistan, um, I mean, I, I think you say something about that and Jack may say more. But, um, I mean, that seems to be um, something which is um, maybe mooted from time to time in scare stories, but I, I think has no basis in, in uh, as it were, ambition. Um, the experience that uh, other countries have had in trying to um, change regimes and pacify, uh, whether it's in Syria or in Iraq or in Libya, doesn't seem to me to be an encouragement to the idea that you can take over another country and make it a better place or at least uh, make it conform to your wishes. So I don't think there's, there's anything in that line. I mean, I'd, uh, the other point that I would pick up, I think, is about um, do nuclear weapons deter conventional war? I mean, I think the answer to that is yes, if conventional war is designed to threaten the existence of the state. And maybe, you know, there are, I and mean, this is where you get into red lines and so forth, but if you actually have a massive attack of state A on state B to the point where its viability, its ability to function, you know, begins to look um, uncertain. Um, that's where I think nuclear deterrence should have worked to stop that happening. And if it hasn't, then deterrence breaks down and then you end up with nuclear release. And I think that's a kind of, 
you know, a generalization of how nuclear weapons are viewed in most of the um, nuclear capable countries. Um, but is that, that takes me to the point about last resort. And that's why um, it seems to me, and I think I said this in my opening piece, you know, the use of nuclear weapons in last resort, in extremis, is something which I think both countries ought to be moving to. Thank you very much, Desmond. And Jack, you have the last word. Oh, wonderful. Very good. Well, in, uh, in reference to threatening Pakistan's existence uh, with conventional warfare, like Antoine's points about uh, looking beyond just conventional tanks and artillery and aircraft, etc., uh, but I would agree with Desmond that India, one, has no basis in ambition, to use his words, in terms of intent. And secondly, I think in capability, of course, it's the military, things can change, things can happen. But I think in capability that in the short term kind of conflict that is envisaged, that India does not have the capability either. And that the time it would take for a naval blockade to really work is you're talking weeks rather than uh, than days. So. I think it's uh, it's unlikely. NFU for Pakistan, uh, General Sharma's question, uh, highly unlikely in my view. It's interesting if one compares Indian and Chinese stances or postures on nuclear issues that oftentimes you find a lot of congruity between the two uh, with not just NFU, but other aspects of their nuclear postures. And in terms of uh, nuclear weapons uh, deterring conventional war, I think uh, Desmond has answered that uh, quite succinctly. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to thank um, Antoine, Desmond and Jack, uh, not only for their excellent presentations and response to the varied questions this morning, but all their work in this project. And the report should shortly become available on the IISSS website. Um, thank you very much to our audience from UK, India, Pakistan and all over the world. Uh, for some very, very useful and stimulating questions. I'm sorry we were only able to get to about half of them, but the ones that weren't put to the speakers, I think you will find answers uh, in, the, in the report. Um, I'd also just like to use my chairman's privilege to conclude by saying um, we should be under absolutely no illusions that a nuclear exchange between India and Pakistan would be disastrous. It would be a humanitarian disaster, it would be an economic disaster, and it could quite possibly create a climate disaster. So I help, hope we've been able to contribute uh, to better understanding of this um, important but unavoidable uh, issue of strategic tension between two extremely important South Asian countries. Thanks very much indeed. That's the end of the event.